Bueno, primeramente eh, me gustaría comenzar dándole las gracias al Comité de Planificación del Debate Latino. Muchas gracias por tenerme aquí en el, en el día de hoy, es un orgullo realmente. También quiero darle las gracias a María Palacios por trabajar todos los detalles de mi viaje y por compartir con todos ustedes. Ella dice que, que para ella es un privilegio presentarme a mí, pero para mí es un privilegio estar aquí y que ella me invitara a mí porque le tengo tanto respeto a ella. Son gracias, María. Gracias, María. Bravo, María. I'm going to switch to English really quick because I want to thank Dr. Preston. Um, when I think of a professor, a teacher, that has impacted my life in a significant way, um, not just because we're debaters, but they, he sees us as Latinos, I think um, about Dr. Preston and I think about the impact that he has had in my life. So I just want to thank Dr. Preston for always being there for us in, in whatever capacity possible. Thank you so much. También quiero darle las gracias a todos ustedes porque, bueno, ser juez ha sido un privilegio y realmente se votaron, como decimos los puertorriqueños. You guys did a great job, so muchísimas gracias por dejarme servir como mujer. Bueno, antes de comenzar, este, quiero mencionar que como muchos de ustedes saben, y María lo mencionó, yo nací en Puerto Rico, pero yo me crié en los Estados Unidos. So, mi escuela, desde que yo estaba en escuela elemental hasta la escuela de Derecho, pues he, he aprendido todas las cosas en inglés, básicamente. Y digo esto para que sepan que la presentación va a ser en Spanish, la mitad va a ser en inglés y la otra mitad va a ser en español. Y bueno, también porque algunos de los conceptos que voy a estar hablando en un ratito son bastante difíciles para entender y este, se los quiero explicar en un lenguaje que pues, es un poquito más fácil para mí comunicárselo y porque mientras ustedes estén en la vida, lo más seguro van a escuchar estos conceptos en inglés en la manera en que se los voy a explicar. Um, bueno, y como ya saben que hablo Spanish, como se dieron cuenta, si hay una palabra que no es ni en inglés ni en español, me la inventé. <risa> so, si hay algo que yo digo que es lo exacto que estás diciendo, escríbanlo y me preguntan al final y yo trato de traducir qué estaba tratando de decir. Quiero reconocer a mi papá, a mi prima, a mi abuela y a mi mamá que están en la audiencia hoy. Gracias por siempre estar ahí. Si algunos de ustedes estuvieron aquí el año pasado y vieron a mami hablar. Bueno, ya no, she killed it. Y quiero que sepan que pues nadie lo puede hacer como ella, so deja ese, ese, you know, disclaimer. Este, pero cada vez que veo a mis padres en la audiencia, a mis familiares en la audiencia, pienso fácilmente qué diferente pudo haber sido mi vida. Porque yo pienso en aquellos que no, que también son merecidos de gozar de la vida, pero no han tenido los privilegios que he tenido yo y que no pueden estar aquí. Porque pienso en un sistema de migración que arranca y separa familias diariamente por no tener documentación. Porque pienso en un complejo industrial de prisiones que injustificadamente criminaliza y encierra a los latinos, a los indios nativoamericanos y a los afroamericanos. Les planteo estas situaciones no solo para honrar a aquellos que no pueden estar aquí en el día de hoy y en nuestras vidas, sino para también hacerle la, según la, la pregunta que les voy a hacer ahora. ¿Qué realmente significa ser un latino con éxito en los Estados Unidos? Permíteme llevar la pregunta un poquito más lejos. ¿Cómo se ve o cómo envisionamos una comunidad latina exitosa? Mientras yo estaba preparando esta presentación y que iba a dar hoy y estaba organizando los temas, yo me pregunté a mí más, ¿por qué me preguntaron a mí para hablar? Bueno, al principio dije, bueno, porque es que soy una persona pretty cool, you know, pretty cool. Um, pero también me puse a pensar que parte de esto es porque comencé mis estudios aquí en Gainesville State College. Y también me puse a pensar que quizás es porque mis credenciales y mis diplomas dirigen a personas a pensar, ella es una latina exitosa en los Estados Unidos. Y Dios sabe lo duro que yo he trabajado para estar donde estoy. Pero mientras yo he tenido muchas oportunidades y muchos de mis hermanos latinos eh, no han podido tener la, las mismas oportunidades, es importante que entendemos que realmente yo no soy exitosa. Yo no puedo tener éxito por muchas razones y les quiero dar algunas de esas razones. Cuando yo era estudiante aquí, yo tenía un amigo mío que se llamaba Misrael Morales. Mi raíz estaba en el LSA board conmigo y también me ayudaba con álgebra. I literally passed algebra because of mi raíz. Y un día, mi raíz fue deportado 
porque estaba conduciendo sin una licencia. ¿Cómo puedo ser exitosa yo? Yo no puedo ser exitosa cuando la mitad, la mitad de mis hermanos y hermanas puertorriqueños están viviendo en pobreza. Yo no puedo ser exitosa cuando ciudades como Detroit están pagándole menos ingresos a la comunidad latina y afroamericana. No tienen ni acceso a agua potable. La sustancia básica que necesitamos para que nuestros cuerpos puedan funcionar. ¿Cómo puedo yo ser exitosa cuando los niños, como los niños palestinos, están siendo bombardeados y la gente que lo está haciendo realmente se está diciendo así es que nos vamos a mantener a salvo o lo estamos haciendo en el nombre de Dios? ¿Cómo puedo ser yo exitosa cuando los niños de América Latina son arrojados en jaula fría en los centros de detención de los Estados Unidos porque solo están buscando refugio, pan y libertad? Yo no puedo tener éxito cuando jóvenes como Mike Brown son asesinados a los tiros por funcionarios del gobierno y su cuerpo es puesto en la calle por cuatro horas para que todo el mundo lo vea, incluyendo a su mamá. No podemos visualizar una comunidad latina exitosa mientras nuestros hermanos y hermanas están siendo asesinados, deportados, encarcelados y dehumanizados. Yo soy parte de mi comunidad y ustedes mi comunidad son parte de mí. Mi comunidad, nuestra comunidad, no va a tener éxito mientras estamos bajo la mira de un sistema que nos quiere heridos, mientras estemos eh, callados, quebrados y, y en un sistema que básicamente está diciendo que las personas que se ven como yo, que hablan como yo y que bailan como yo, no pertenecemos aquí. Así que vamos a visualizar y vamos a hablar un ratito de qué realmente es una comunidad latina exitosa. La respuesta consiste de algo más que títulos y credenciales. Hemos olvidado del ingrediente principal. Nos hemos olvidado del amor. Una comunidad latina exitosa implica una comunidad que ama. ¿Ustedes saben quién es Bell Hooks? ¿Does anybody know who Bell Hooks is? Yes. Awesome. Bell Hooks, really quick in English, she's a, fe a, a very famous feminist contemporary writer, so I encourage you all to, to look her up. Pero, esto es lo que Bell Hooks tiene que decir sobre el amor. Ella dice, donde hay amor, dominación es imposible, porque la dominación es lo contrario del amor. Ahora, el amor que yo estoy hablando no es amor que, que vemos vendiendo en Valentine's Day o, you know, hashtag relationship goals o, you know, hashtag power couples. No, eso, eso no es lo que estoy hablando. El amor que estoy hablando hoy es el amor que se ha comprometido a amar a los que son considerados no dignos de amar. Amar a aquellos que la sociedad nos ha enseñado que no deben de ser amados porque son diferentes a nosotros. El tipo de amor que estoy hablando es el amor que se ha comprometido a la justicia. La construcción de una comunidad que ama no es solo acerca de los sentimientos o de la teoría sobre la vida, no. Para vivir en una sociedad que sea justa e inclusiva, amar es necesario. ¿Ustedes conocen a Sophie Cruz? ¿No? Sí, sí. Bueno, Sophie Cruz, si vieron las noticias, era la niña de 5 años que corrió hacia el Papa. No sé si lo vieron en las noticias, pero bueno... Ok, cool. Eh, Sophie, si estuviéramos en una, en una comunidad exitosa, Sophie estuviera pensando en qué regalo ella quiere for her next birthday, right? Porque es una niña. En vez de estar corriendo al Papa para darle una carta que dice, por favor, no deportes a mis padres. Vivimos en una sociedad en que esa niña tiene que vivir todos los días en temor porque sus papás pueden ser arrancado en cualquier día de su vida. ¿Cómo puedo ser yo exitosa cuando esto está pasando con tanto de nuestros niños? Bueno, ahora vamos a trabajar. So, uh, vamos a, a ver cómo es que los sistemas políticos y las estructuras que tienen el poder de impactar y dirigir nuestras vidas, nuestra gente y nosotros como latinos hacia el éxito o hacia la desolación. So, en estos momentos, I'm going to translate completely into English and I'm going to be using these PowerPoint slides. Again, what I'm going to be talking about today, it's, it's hard. These are concepts that are difficult, and you may not understand them all by the end of the presentation, and that's okay. Um, but if you guys have any questions at the end, maybe I don't have time when I'm up here, but afterwards I'll be here, feel free to, to, to ask me. 
What I did also want to mention is a lot of the information that I'm going to be talking about today came from Professor John Powell, who, as Maria mentioned, I'm a research assistant for at the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. So I'm not this smart. I'm just translating the material. <laughs> um, so let's get started. So what do I mean when I say structures? Well, structures are systems or in institutions like the ones that you see on this PowerPoint. like a criminal justice system, housing, education, transportation, food. Structures, they're non-linear, and as you guys can see, I kind of went crazy with the arrows. It's because all of those things, structures, they inform and they interact with each other. How do they do that, Stephanie? Well, ustedes saben, where you live depends on what school you're going to go to. What school you go to depends on where you're going to get an education. Where you're going to get an education depends what kind of opportunities you're going to have. Do you guys get my drift? It, it's they're always informing each other, and uh, they're nonlinear. So you might ask yourself, okay, Stephanie, but why, what really are structures, and, and why, do I, why do I care about them? Well, we live in systems. We live in these structures. And the structures themselves, as we're going to talk about in a minute, they're not neutral. Structures produce outcomes, regardless of whatever someone's intent was, they produce outcomes, and those outcomes are not neutral. Structures can enhance our life outcomes, or they can diminish them. Structures also create meaning. We're going to talk about this. This is just a little bit of a preview. They shape who we think we are and who we think others are. And as I mentioned, we live in structures, and structures live within us. So I want us to take this picture uh, as an example. So assume that we have a building with two floors. And there was folks on a committee that had to build a structure to think about how to get people from the first floor to the second floor. The structure that they chose to build was an escalator. As I just said, structures are not neutral. Here, you have a man on a wheelchair that's literally looking at a structure. And he's thinking, how am I going to get to the second floor? Whoever created this structure didn't intend necessarily to exclude someone. Right? But the outcome is that some people are going to be disadvantaged because of this structure. Someone in a wheelchair, maybe someone with a baby shoulder, an older person with a walker. Right? And some people are going to be advantaged because of this structure. People who can stand and walk. We have a structure that sorts people along physical lines in this case. And we have a structure that is physically moving people to different opportunities. Here's the key. On the second floor, there's opportunities. Maybe there's a job there. Maybe the food court is there, so they need to get food. Maybe security is up there and something happened to him and he needs to tell security. Maybe there's a sale going on, right? So structures are also creating opportunities for people, but the structures themselves are not creating those opportunities for everyone. So we just talked about how structures can differentiate people between physical lines. Structures can also do this with race, right? So think about zero tolerance policies. This is a neutral structure. We say we have zero tolerance policies in our schools. There's, if you act up, you get out, right? Essentially the gist of it. But we know, based on studies, that 70% of the students who are arrested in school are Latino or black. Well, Stephanie, it's just because Latinos and black are worse kids, they act worse. No, studies have shown us that white, black, Latino kids, and all other kids act in the same ways. Okay. So I say that to say that you have a structure and it can be racialized. And this process of how structures racialize people is called structural racialization. As you guys can see at the bottom of the PowerPoint, it says structural racialization leads to marginalization based on things like race, gender, ethnicity, language, right? And it can also lead to blocked access to opportunity. So here we have something that Professor Powell calls the circle of human concern. I just mentioned that structures marginalize. But how does that actually happen? How do structures marginalize? Well, they marginalize when their outcomes determine who is in the circle of human concern and who is outside the circle of human concern. And this is what society values, okay? They value citizens, okay? They value mothers, 
Not all mothers equally, but they value the elderly and they value children. Not all children equally, we know that and we can dig into that a little more. But the gist is that the people on the outside, people like undocumented immigrants, people like Afro-Latinos and Latinos with darker skin, people who have been incarcerated and have convicted of felony, Muslims, homelessness, all of these issues and things are people that have been excluded and those who have been excluded, that's created. That didn't just happen, right? So you might be thinking, Stephanie, how do you, how do you create someone who's been excluded? You guys spoke about that today, right? Through laws, right? Through discrimination, through vigilantes, you're telling someone you do not belong. So the history of the United States, and I know some of you actually mentioned this, is thick with examples of us excluding people. Someone mentioned the Dred Scott case. The Dred Scott case said, Persons of African descent are not citizens of this country. They were saying, you are not in the circle of human concern, which means you are not cared for, you are not seen, and you are not loved. When we talk about marginalization, marginalization is really important, right? And, and it's, it's a serious concept because it's worse than exploitation. Why? Because when we exploit people, we still see value in them, right? We want to use them and we want to exploit them. When we marginalize people, we see no value in them. So what happens at the extreme? Things like genocide. But there's also examples of when the circle of human concern has been expanded in our history. How many of you know Brown versus Board of Education? Awesome, awesome. So basically what that case did is said, no United States of America, <coughs> southern states, okay? Separate but equal is not okay. So, like I said a little previously, structures marginalize and structures also create or block access to opportunity for some people. What are some of those things? Well, you have things like high quality education. That's enhancing your life outcome. That's a structure. Stable housing. Political empowerment. You guys are politically empowering people when you're telling them go vote, right? Um, outcomes for wealth building and a whole host of other things. When we think about opportunity, the things that I kind of just mentioned, opportunity is racialized and it's also spatialized. I think this is a really good example of starting to think about what that means. So you have the cycle of poverty, right? The argument is Latinos and blacks are poor because they just don't work hard enough, right? That's the argument. We are not working hard enough, so therefore you're poor. That's actually not what's happening. There are structures in place that are continuing a cycle. So you have things like racial and economic neighborhood segregation. We are living in times where neighborhood segregation are at the same level, or worse in some instances, than they were back in the 1960s. So what happens when we have those kinds of segregation and those kinds of patterns? It leads to segregation in schools, right? Because where you go to school depends on where you live. What happens when you go to a school that has less opportunity? You have lower resources. It means you have lower educational opportunities. When you have lower educational opportunities, the people who are more affluent in your community are like, why am I going to keep my kid here? I want to get out. I'm going to go somewhere else where you have more access to opportunity. But what does that lead to? More segregation. These are structures that are in place that are enabling these things. So here's just a really quick picture of how structures have, basically the outcomes that we're seeing are the same. You have something like police brutality. On the left, you have a picture of um, the 1960s, the civil rights movement, and on the right, this is Ferguson. This is 2014. Nothing has changed because the structures themselves has not changed. We have to change them. And the bottom is a picture of New Orleans before, he was 1940-something, and New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, right? There was obviously a, a hurricane, but the point is that even before the night the hurricane hit, people were still living at these levels of poverty, which is why a lot of people died in that hurricane, but. All right, leads me to the question, why should we care about this stuff? You know, and a lot of people tell me, this is really depressing, Stephanie, and this is really hard, and I kinda don't wanna learn about it. Or they say something like, you know, I want to focus on myself and I want to focus on my family. And sometimes I have to like you know, take a deep breath. But to be honest, that is a very reasonable reaction. It really is. It's hard to understand how structures work. We are not taught that in school. Okay? We are taught to think at a very interpersonal level. And second, it's, it's really hard to constantly think about these events. It's painful. Okay? Two million Latinos have been deported under Obama's administration in the past seven years. 
years, okay? One in every 28 hours, a black man, an unarmed black man, is shot by a federal official in this country. So this stuff is hard and I understand. But why should we care about this? Because at the very least, it's affecting our health. Structural racialization is producing inequality, and inequality is literally affecting our health. Studies show that Latinos have a higher death rate than whites for diabetes, <coughs> hypertension, liver cirrhosis, and homicide. So I talked about how structures literally change people's outcomes in the physical sense. Now I want to talk a little bit about how they change how we think about ourselves and how we think about other people, right? How does this actually happen and, and what's actually happening? So I'm going to talk about these concepts called othering and belonging. So what do I mean when I say othering? It's a little self-explanatory, but essentially what it means is when we consciously or unconsciously don't feel connected to people. When we consciously or unconsciously are willing to hurt someone else in ways that we are not willing to hurt ourselves or the people that we love. That's when we other people. And people are othered on a whole host of things. Language, hablando el español, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and many other things. So how does this, how does this actually happen, right? So here we have a picture of a guy with a really big head and some, a lot of stuff is going on in his brain, right? And some really smart scientists have essentially figured out how is it that our brain is working, right? What is happening in our unconscious mind that we are producing these things? So essentially what they found is that your brain processes 11 million bytes per second, okay? 11 million, Ooh, that's a lot, okay? But we only consciously process 40 of those at best. So there's a lot of things going on that we are not consciously aware of. Messages can be framed to speak to our unconscious as well. And the process of othering, what I've been talking about, happens in your unconscious brain. Sometimes we're not really even aware of it. So we're going to skip this, and we're going to go to this. I'm going to walk around a little bit because I, I don't like being behind the podium. First of all, I want to congratulate those of you who actually pushed back against this because that was, that was really great. Yes, yes. Um, congratulations. So I want you guys, this is going to be a little bit interactive, what are the implicit biases that is being triggered when you guys see this picture? Anyone can shout in. What is it? White twin. White twin. Male. White, White male. male win. Yep. What else? Stereotypes. Stereotypes, is that what it said? Yeah. Yes. Great point. Women must run in heels. Women must run in heels. Right, tell it. And look good while doing it. And you look good while doing it, that's right. It's also saying that black men don't lead. It's saying that Latinas will not finish the finish line. It's not saying explicitly, but it's triggering our implicit biases. Who is being othered as a result of this picture? Minorities. Minorities, right? Basically this picture is saying some of you, white men, belong more than the black man and the Latina woman. And I'm assuming she's Latina. Do you guys remember what your president's response was when she saw this picture and you guys pushed back? What was her response? She responded, I read an article, and she said, it was not our intent to hurt anyone. But as you guys know because of this presentation, the intent, it doesn't matter. Because the outcome of this picture is that we were othered. We were told, you don't belong. You know, people can say, well, if you don't belong, that's just your feelings. It doesn't really matter. But actually, that's not the case. Sense of belonging is very important. The University of Texas Austin study showed that 40% of their students were not graduating college in six years. The majority of those were low-income black and Latino students. And you know what was the central factor that was causing them not to graduate? They didn't belong. That's right. They said that they did not feel like they belonged there. This is serious, and this should have been handled in a serious way. We can change this, you guys. There are ways to think about um, strategies to move forward, okay? So one thing that we have to start doing 
If we have to stop thinking about individual lens to change and think about transformational changes that include structural changes. So what do I mean by that? Let's take the UNG cover photo as an example, okay? An individual level change to what happened with that picture would have been just fire the person that was in charge of it. It's more than likely someone else would have come along into that position and this could have happened again. Why? Because the structure is not changing. This is the reason why even if you fire Darren Wilson for murdering Mike Brown, there are still a number of police officers around this country that are murdering us. So in this case, what would have been a structural change? And if anybody thinks about it, y'all can answer. No? Okay, it's a little hard. Some of the changes could have been reevaluating how the decisions are made for this cover. Who's on the committee? Are they thinking about their implicit biases? Are there any blacks or Latinos on the committee thinking about how they could be triggered? Is the message sending a message that you belong, that everyone belongs, or is it othering some people? Those would have been structural changes that if that's the process, regardless of who comes into that position, the picture would have been substantially different. So then, a lot of people frame this argument that, you know what, me as a person who has certain privileges, I don't really care about this stuff because this is a Latino and black issue. Well, actually that's not true. While a lot of these inequalities do affect us differently, depending on what identities we have and how we're situated against structures, we know that we have linked fate and inequality actually affects us all. So what this study found, uh, well, let me tell you what actually they did. They took countries, different countries, okay? And they took income inequality. So they said you have low income inequality versus high income inequality. And then they measured that against the social health of your country. And they measured that with things like life expectancy, infant mortality, teenage births, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. What they found is if you have low income inequality in your country, you're more likely to be an overall healthy country. You see that, that arrow I have in the red? That's us. That's the United States of America. We have the highest income inequality and the worst social health as a country. This affects all of us, we're sick. So, I wanna reiterate again, when I say I'm not successful, I can't be successful when this is happening. The country that I envision, the society that I envision, is one in which all of us are inside the circle of human concern. In which all of us, regardless if we vote or not, this is key, right? Regardless if we vote or not, we are still loved, we are still cared for. Because let me tell you something, black women, out of all the groups, were the highest number of voters when President Obama became president. And they still experience higher infant mortality rates. Black women with college education have higher infant mortality rates than white women with a high school education. Voting is not stopping that, okay? So I want a circle where they are cared for, where they are loved, where our moms, our, our kids are not being taken away from our moms our sisters, our wives, our brothers. So if you guys take away anything from all that I've said, let it be this. What does it mean to be successful? Okay. What is the vision? And I think that Professor Powell has articulated that the best. And what I mean by that is a beloved community where being connected to the other is seen as a foundation to a healthy self, not its destruction. And while the racial other is seen not as the infinite other, but rather the other that is already and always a part of us. If we can live this way, then and only then are we going to become successful as people, as a Latino community, and as a society. Thank you all so much for your attention.